Okay, shall we start? Yes, good morning again. Um, this is the link to the material. If you want to get that, because we will do again a bit of copy pasting today, that's maybe the easiest way to get uh, the instructions into the system. I have updated a bit the required software. Uh, there may be missing for you the last entries here. We need later on, not now, but you can probably just do it now, uh, three Python libraries. Uh, no idea about Mac users, any Mac users here today? Do you have Mac? Do you have on Mac this PIP software? Yes? Okay, so probably this applies also here, then I will write also Mac. Is, it, is the font okay for you, or you consider to come closer or uh, enlarge more? Yes, yes. Not sure if it completely... No, it's okay. Um, so, what you need is Chrome or Chromium browser. Is it true? Yes because um, we want to use the RESTman um, unless you prefer command line, which is equally fine. Uh, I will uh, In the tutorial, I've written out everything like command line with curl, but I think you can also copy-paste it into this graphical RESTman tool. That's an extension for Chromium. I'm not aware, but it may exist of any uh, REST client for Firefox. So this RESTman is here then, and it looks like this. You can do stuff. We will do this in a moment, and it will ask you for username and so on. We will come to that. So um, it's up to you what you prefer. Going back to the text. So the browser, because of the extension, if you have a different um, REST client you like, tell me and I will add it happily. I just did a quick search what's existing and what looks reasonable. And then we will use something on command line that is uh, the, uh, let's say, the usage of grass commands, uh, sorry, of Actinia commands uh, through a grass shell. And for this our client, we need to have uh, these packages, uh, Python packages installed. So for the Windows users, we recommend to use OSGEO for Windows, like even the last days. If you have done your installation with this installer, you just have to, uh, to get that installer again. And in the advanced section, uh, you can find under libraries these three libraries. I checked if they are present. They are. Um, there's a search window where you could copy the name and then just select them and next, 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 and you have them. Yes. Ah, uh, yeah, that's, uh, that's maybe an issue, is it? Maybe not. So the thing is, um, the grass session is only a kind of container for this application, the application a, a, uh, ACE or whatever we want to pronounce it um, is uh, written in Python 3. It's a standalone script in the end, but it makes use of one function which is not present in 7.6. <coughs> Maybe. Um, yeah, to be honest, I didn't think of that. It will not happen that we backport it to 7.6, but it also unfortunately didn't happen that we published the final 7.8.0. I'm not sure if in the under development there's not 7.8, right? So how many Windows users do we have here? One, two, you also? No. Okay. So 
So in, Ob in, in Debian and Ubuntu's uh, testing or experimental, not sure, is the 7.8 available? The other way is I show you, but of course you would pr prefer to try yourself. So, um, yeah, for this, this part, it's unavoidable to have 7.8 plus. But we will start with, uh, let's say, some basics first. Just a, another question from my side, uh, who is uh, familiar with REST in general? I hope for maybe nobody, so congratulations, because you probably know much more than me. Um, but I start from the very beginning to get all on, onto the same page. Are you kind of settled now with this uh, installation stuff? Yeah, maybe you do it in parallel then. <laughs> so, um, the graphical introduction I have linked here. This we have seen before. I don't know if you want to see it again. Maybe not. And um, that was setting the scene. Why we did this uh, development and what it does is just in a nutshell. Uh, you can look it up again if you want to have more background. Mm. We assume working knowledge here, what uh, concerns uh, GIS analysis, remote sensing and so on. But this is probably not an idea. So I start with this REST magic here, representational state transfer API and some cloud basics. Um, I'm not telling much about uh, how this cloud stuff works like Docker, OpenShift and so on. It's not needed here, but uh, if you have questions, then just simply ask. Okay. Um, maybe not clear to everyone uh, why we do this cloud computing. So this is uh, just a quick view on, uh, on things here. You know about the Copernicus program that we get probably um, almost one petabyte per satellite per year, which is yeah, unprecedented for sure. The Landsat archive is, I don't know, it's very long, it's 40 years of data, but still the resolution was lower and the temporal resolution as well. So the amount of data produced by the Sentinel satellites is really, really uh, enormous. And if you want to process that, time series and so on, you want to avoid two things, to transfer the data to your own infrastructure, because you usually don't even have it. Um, one Sentinel-2 scene is something like one gigabyte, um, but if you process it, then you have another gigabyte, maybe. It depends on what you produce. If you do like uh, index computation, of course, you reduce the number of channels to some resulting maps, then it's a fraction of that, but still it is pretty heavy. And if you then try to uh, compute the, uh, let's say, the ongoing vegetation index throughout the year, you have one coverage every five days, or even more, depends on where you are, even higher between three and five days, so it accumulates to a lot of data. Uh, the, I think Germany is covered by 50 Sentinel-2 scenes, so you would have um, one year is like 50 weeks. Yeah, if each week one coverage, so we have 50 times uh, 50 tiles, yeah, and then multiply one giga, and so on and so on, and so it comes to something. Mm. Yeah. The idea is to have the data in not so many places. Uh, there's an, some, there are some initiatives called DIAS that are infrastructures funded by the European Commission, ESA, no, European Commission, in order to uh, set up infrastructures which are dedicated to Copernicus and related. And um, there are also private marketplaces out there. And the idea is to compute things where the data are in order to minimize the amount of transfer. It's still quite some work in progress, in my view. Data storage is solved differently, and so on and so on. But anyway, so we want to address this compute next to the data here. You won't, don't want to bother yourself with uh, uh, data management, and that's what the well, that's something what the cloud is for. A big problem is uh, there's a new term, or not so new, maybe analysis-ready data. Yeah, the user wants to have data which are ready to use. You do not probably want to do atmospheric correction because you have no idea how to do that, 
or uh, in with SAR processing the raw SAR data, you have to do quite a few steps in order to turn them into something which you can overlay to your GIS data uh, and other steps as well. But also in the GIS world, uh, like uh, laser scan data are sometimes uh, delivered as point clouds, but if you're interested in a surface model, you have to derive it somehow from that. If you already get that, for some users it would be much easier because they have no clue how to do raster binning of point clouds and so forth. So this is all towards analysis-ready data. You take the data, you can just compute things. Um, it would be wonderful to have such data already in your cloud infrastructure, but often it is not yet the case. And this will take for sure more time. Um, we are also working on that, so we, we develop like uh, pipelines, processing chains in order to turn the raw data into something which can then be used. Um, and of course, this is also in terms of reproducible science, very interesting. Uh, you want to have those things documented so that you really know how those raw data got turned into something usable. If it was done right, so if you have reprojection uh, with raster data, what resampling method was used, if the datum, geodetic datum was right, and so on. So there are a few things which have to be considered. Um, there's a lack of compatibility between different data systems. Uh, data systems in this sense also in terms of backends. Um, so some of you know Google Earth Engine. This is one way of doing it. Others know probably Rastaman and so on. So different solutions. There's GeoTrellis and so on. And in the OpenEO project, uh, we try to address this and bring it like what GDAL is to different data formats. We want to, to, to apply the same idea to API standardization. There's much more into it, but um, not now. This would, and ah yes, and then at Phosphor G, we also were also discussing the lack of cloud abstraction. If you want to move from one cloud provider to the next, for example, from commercial provider number A in US to commercial provider number G in US or to some provider in Europe, other name. Yeah, you cannot just take it and move it over and deploy it there. It will not work because there are so many special things there uh, which have to be considered that you, if you move from one to the next, probably have to partially rewrite everything. So there's quite some uh, work to be done yet. Of course, those cloud, cloud providers, they want to keep your, so maybe it's also intentional, this kind of stuff. So what we have done, you have already seen the short introduction to Actinia. We have been uh, developing this major work of Sören Gebert in this case, who's maybe known to someone. He's also a co-author of the temporal grass stuff. Um, and uh, in much in collaboration uh, with Etzer uh, on the work of Sören. He's a co-developer of uh, Actinia and um, he wanted to develop a REST API around the GRASS.js functionality, but even more, as I already mentioned, so you can extend things uh, in a way that you can also deploy your own software. And it is open source, importantly. So maybe we take a quick look at the GitHub page. So it looks like GitHub. And um, here you have the different scripts and the source code and so on. And here you can see, get some background. There's also a small publication, which we wrote for a big data from space conference in February, which gives an overview for pages on Actinia. And um, well, yeah, documentation is there and so forth. And these are some examples we can look at later. So I don't want to dive too much into the technical details. Uh, it is using Flask and Redisk, I was already mentioning. It's written in Python and it's open source, so you can take a look. The idea is uh, to extend functionality. Maybe it uh, will require some refactoring of the code at some point in future. Um, this will be done when it is time. So I was also mentioning uh, different storage concepts. So now looking more into the details of Actinia, this is 
not very difficult to understand, I believe. Uh, there's the persistent storage, which sounds like it is always there, even if you would switch it off, the data remain. And this is something, let's say, from our point of view, we are offering data in the cloud infrastructure to our users. Yeah, we would maybe offer the global elevation model, SRTM, which is a pretty heavy file, to avoid that they have to download it every day. And they can just operate on this file in their area of interest. Yeah, that is a 30-meter uh, global elevation model. But if there are other elevation models, we could have a full catalog of them and say, okay, there's also the European 25 meters one. For this federal state, we have a one-meter elevation model available and so on and so on. We could all put them there and make them available through this metadata management, and this would go into the persistent storage. This can be even offered to... Um, to users uh, that they can store their data there. It is similar to the usage of the GRASS database, what we have done recently. The ephemeral storage is uh, volatile, so data disappear after a while. Imagine you are doing some computation, you have an elevation model and you want to compute the sun, uh, sun insulation from that. Then you only want to retrieve the resulting GeoTIFF file in this case or you do some generalization of a vector map, uh, you want to have the resulting vector map, you would download it, and then it can just disappear. You don't care if it's still there on the cloud or not. And since somebody has to pay for the cloud storage, uh, this is done usually in the ephemeral storage, uh, which means that it is uh, scheduled for deletion after, say, 24 hours. So the Actinia process will tell you once, once the job is done, look, here's the download link, um, and you know, okay, it will be there valid for 24 hours and then it disappears. Then you would have to recompute it if you didn't download yet. Again, um, this cloud computing thing is quite connected to cost. Um, if you, if you uh, order machines or storage or network resources, even downloading costs something often, depends on the cloud uh, provider. Yeah, this has to be paid somehow. So th with the resources, uh, we have to be a bit careful, and that's why all these kind of measures exist. <coughs> okay. Um, any questions so far? But just interrupt me as needed. So there's then the Actinia server. You could think it's a kind of orchestrator machine which is keeping, taking care of the jobs being received, of... Um, yeah, the, the user management and so on, and also taking care of the data themselves. So this you have already seen. This could be some orchestrator. There are some more nodes around it. Um, currently, it is not yet set up like this, but it will be in the near future that those do not even exist uh, when nobody is doing anything. So let's say a, a call comes in and the orchestrator machine Seth uh, realizes, okay, uh, we need to have more resources, then it would spawn more machines on the, in the cloud infrastructure automatically, sends the job there, the number crunching is done, result is made available to the user, and then these machines get deactivated. So on a timeline, we have like minimal cost, then machines are ordered, the costs increase, uh, job is done, uh, the machines are destroyed, and then it goes on, and only the coordinating machine, orchestrator machine remains. Yeah, I think this I have already explained before. Um, okay, how to get back now? So storage is done. Uh, then I mentioned this load balancer. The load balancer is responsible for getting the job distributed over the different nodes. By the way, there's another talk we gave at FOS4G uh, last week, which is more into this uh, stuff, but with a focus on image classification and how we use it for the fiber optics planning. So the link is there if you are interested. Then a few words before we start uh, with the REST API about deployment. Mm. Who of you is familiar with cloud stuff in general? So do you know what deployment means? Yes? 
a few, a little bit, some, maybe not. Okay, just a few words also here. Uh, one of these buzzwords is uh, infrastructure as code. This is something we use in, in one of our projects. The idea is basically, you know, if you write a script, the script is doing what you ideally doing what you have written down there. Basically, it is doing what you have written there. It is not necessarily what you wanted, but uh, let's say uh, you have the code. So now we bring this idea to setting up the entire infrastructure. What means um, order machines, set up the network, define the users, uh, order storage resources, connect the storage, and so on and so on. You can imagine that's a kind of big uh, architecture which can be set up like this, but it is only done by scripts. So in the end, if the entire data center is destroyed and you have your script separately stored, you can just launch it somewhere else if the uh, cloud infrastructure is compliant. And um, the idea is to have like a failover uh, safe uh, software or infrastructure and you code it as scripts. We, can, we will not uh, talk about this in detail right now, but uh, you can I probably now imagine. And to launch something is called deploying the software. It then runs in one of these compute nodes, for example. And another buzzword is this one, continuous integration, continuous deployment. You can now imagine if you have an infrastructure with everything what I just de described, and you are going into production and you offer the service of processing Sentinel data, for example, um, you will discover something you want to improve. But the thing is running there. And you, your customers or users are there. They do not want to see any downtime. Um, it must run all the time. Yeah, cloud must be available. This is what the user expectation is. So how to address the, this problem that you want to be always up on, on the one side, but also be able to let's say, uh, deploy modifications, improvements, or what it is. This is called CICD, and you, can, uh, you have a lot of tests involved, and when you say, uh, okay, I have a new processing chain of Sentinel, I want to get it into the main infrastructure, you just not happily copy it there and hope the best, but you uh, do this deployment, but you do it in a kind of multi-stage. Yeah, you first deploy it into an internal version, and if all the tests run through and it looks nice, then it migrates to the production side. And so you can continuously uh, get things out. That is the continuous deployment, and with the integration, we mean that we can modify things and we have test systems and so forth. Just to give you an idea, uh, in a nutshell, what it is about. And then... The system what we use here uh, in the background is Docker. Docker is a para uh, virtualization, which means you do not have a virtual machine like with VirtualBox, which is completely uh, virtual, but you only use like kind of shared resources of the kernel. Kind of the differences, for example, uh, this is a Fedora machine, but if I want to run a Ubuntu there because I want to test something because Ubuntu users told me it doesn't work, yeah, I can deploy in Docker uh, Ubuntu, but it only uh, uses kind of differences between the Ubuntu and the Fedora in this case. So this is something pretty clever. And another feature is that it doesn't come like a big huge binary. So like one DVD is four dot something gigabyte, but it does it in tiny uh, layers and only those layers are then sent around. So you can get everything into a very small copies. So a full, let's say, a full grass installation on Ubuntu with PDAL and so on uh, would be only 80 megabyte. Yeah, it's on Docker Hub, you can see. And if you copy it to your machine, it runs, it behaves like a Ubuntu installation, but it only uses the differences. So I like this pretty much because you save a lot of resources and you don't move huge binaries around and so on. So Docker is like one single thing. And then there are Docker Compose and Docker Swarm if you want to send out different nodes. Maybe I just show it here live. Ah, sorry. Yes. So I connect to our Actinia server, the one we will be using now. 
and I write, show me the processes running. And you can see here, there are different containers. So there are different instances of Actinia core running, production and version 5 it is internally. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. And the Redis database uh, I already mentioned for job management is a separate container. So you have these node. This is one machine only, but still it behaves like it were eight machines plus the database machine in parallel and all of them, they are connected. And this I could also deploy on a distributed system in a, in a big data center. This is just uh, uh, one cloud server we have somewhere in a data center, but it's not a big one because it's too expensive to play around. Um, yeah, uh, uptime you can see I just uh, restarted is this, it this morning um, in order to have some changes. Yeah, and they are the workers and they are doing the stuff. Okay, and then a quick view on the components on a full architecture, how it could be. Uh, the core is, of course, the analytical part because we want to compute something. Uh, we have connections to external data sources like Sentinel Hub or NASA or whatever it is. Different interface layers, most importantly, the REST API, which we will be looking at. We have an open EO interface, which is also on GitHub. Uh, we have the Actinia command execution interface to run it from, control it from the grass session, metadata management, uh, database connection to OGC stuff and uh, geo server things. This is from this one presentation, the view. Okay, it looks complicated, nice, but still uh, analytics is here, external data sources there, interface layer is the core, the orchestrator machine, the link to the metadata, link to the database systems, and here uh, we also have something under development to push the results, what we compute here directly into GeoServer, so that you can then uh, make it available to users through uh, web services and whatever you like. Okay. Now, a few words about REST. So, I must say I'm a geographer, so today is the day of declaring that you are not the right person for your job, but still I hope I can get it over. This is the what I understood part of REST API, okay? Um, yeah, so what is it about? Uh, it is really about uh, communicate or an API in general is something to let different software packages or softwares communicate or services communicate with, among each other. So if you, if you use some software, you click on it. This is, of course, some communication kind of way, but it's not machine readable. And if you have different software systems, then you use like HTTPS in order to uh, open some, or HTTP to open some web pages in a browser. This is already some machine-to-machine -machine communication because you use your computer here and request something from a remote server. So, and some people brought it to uh, something which we call REST. And here you have links for further details. It's a web API for creating web services that communicate with so-called web resources. So, what does it mean? We can basically, with the REST API, uh, execute commands remotely. Mm. So, if I say, uh, I want to see this Wikipedia page, this is already kind of execution of something remotely because the server remotely has to generate the page or get it to me somehow. Yeah, but here we are in the geospatial context, so we want to do some uh, geo computation. Um, and we also want to have results back, not just like informational pages, but even like uh, raw data, or let's say geo data. Uh, WPS you are familiar with, probably. It's not so different, but it's a completely different standard. You also say web processing service. I want to process something there, and I want to get back the result. A REST call um, is something where we receive a response and remotely maybe some processing has happened. And we have four parts here. Um, the so-called endpoints. The endpoint is something which does uh, a certain task. We have the header, we have data or a body and the methods. 
and I will now look into this in detail. Mm. So an endpoint is more or less a URL. Yeah, if you, it follows some structure, you have an API, some server or whatever it is, and uh, then you attach, like in browsing web pages, you attach some more parameters there. So as an example, um, we have here API of GitHub, some user, and I want to see the repositories. With repos, we just see the list of repositories, but now we can attach also something uh, which is a parameter, uh, often comes with key value pairs. So we have here the query equal value. Yeah, we can even concatenate more and another query value. And as an example, we do here query is sort and the value is pushed. So this is coming from the GitHub API. And clicking on this or sending this uh, through our curl or restman later, it would uh, get back uh, the result. So now you see nothing. And this nothing reason is because that is JSON. So this is a specific format. And we can, so in, in Firefox it comes like this. You can click on this triangle and you see something more. And now you see the repositories this user has. For example, grass repository fork. You can expand also this stuff here. Okay, there's not much there, just the extension of the name. Um, created this date, and so on. So now, next one. Yeah, Actinia core, next repo, and so on. So apparently this user has quite a few. And the representation is in this format. The browser itself does it like uh, more readable with colors and so on, but uh, we can see raw data. The raw data look like this. So if you are familiar with XML, then you might see that this is a little bit more readable. Um, not sure if that was the reason to invent it, but anyway. Okay, then we have header and body. Um, a request which you send to the server and a response you retrieve back comes with uh, a header showing details and optionally a body which contains something. The body contains, for example, uh, data you are retrieving back. So you request the server send me population table and you get it back like this, of course, in JSON format. Oh, I see the format is messed up here, unfortunately. Um, we have different request methods. We can do some get. So sorry for this should be a nice list, but it isn't today. Um, the get, if you send a get to the, the server, then you want to receive a copy of a resource. If you send a so-called post statement, then you send data. Imagine uh, you have a server which comes with uh, population data, but you don't want to have the population data entirely, let's say a population map actually, but you want to do zonal statistic and your statistics and you want to have the data for your administrative area you are interested in. So you have to tell the server, look, this is the administrative boundary. You can ge create a GeoJSON file, for example, and send it to the server. Yeah, this is a file. And with a post statement, sorry, I should highlight post. With the post statement, um, you actually tell the server, okay, I'm not only requesting something, but as payload, I also send you this file. Please use it for the request. And the request do zonal statistics, that would be one of the endpoints we have already heard of before. Because it could also be, give me the summary, is the sum of all people living there. Yeah, that would be something else globally. Yeah, would be different tasks or different endpoint. And um, with the post, you send actually data to the server in order to create something new. With the put, you can also modify something remotely. So now you probably start to understand that it is something which is really doing computation remotely. And with a delete, you can delete something remotely. 
So using these uh, commands here, you have kind of remote control. So, and then you can get back responses. <clears throat> um, those responses you know already from HTTP web pages. Everything is okay. Or 404, you know resource not found. 401, you are not authorized. 500, internal server error. Maybe you sent uh, some request which the server just didn't understand. Means the resource would be there, but it cannot get it, and so it sends a 500. There are many more codes. Uh, there's a web page for that to look it up. But usually in a service, you should also get some human readable um, message back. So the JSON format, which is fundamental here, uh, I already mentioned. And it looks like this. So this is an example here. We have in GRASS now the possibility, and that's why you need GRASS 7.8, to turn some command into a JSON statement automatically. So if I run the vBuffer, I don't know who was here yesterday, some of you. Um, vBuffer does a vector buffer, taking the road lines input map and writes out a new map called road buffer, 10 meters, and distance 10 meters. So it's 10 map units, but let's say meters here. This would be a standard GRASS command. And we turn it into a JSON statement just by adding this minus minus JSON. But it needs to be a full command. So you cannot just run vbuffer uh, minus minus JSON. It will not do anything. So I just show you an example, v buffer. I think with should work also with. I don't know if it works with minus help. Didn't test. No, it doesn't because it doesn't make sense. Um, so this help text, you could have in a, as a resource, but for a machine it's useless. No, it's just uh, for humans. So input my map, output uh, new map, distance equal 10, minus minus JSON, turns it into a JSON. The command was not executed here, yeah, importantly. As you see, it didn't do anything. It only shows the representation in JSON. And why is that relevant? Because this we would use then in order later on if we want to use it from the grass session directly to send this command to the remote instance using this uh, ACE helper tool. But we will come to that. So now what do we see here? Uh, curly braces. And then we have module is vbuffer. The ID, it gets uh, an some random number here in order to be distinguishable if you submit several V buffers. It's not that they necessarily finish like this. Imagine the job runs for several hours because of massive data or whatever it is. Uh, then you need to distinguish those jobs if you submit it once again. That's all. So, and then we have a section of input data here, inputs. And here we have a list of parameters. Parameter, input, value, road lines. So the trick with JSON is that you have the key value, key value pairs, which belong together. Yeah. So it is basically what you see there is also here. Uh, you will may wonder why this here, which I don't see over there, because that are default values which are automatically uh, used here. I think in the help text, you can see that. What was it? Sorry, I'm already lost. Uh, Type, yeah. Type, here the default. Since it is a default, it is also given to the JSON file. Or JSON representation. Well, and then we have outputs, because there could be many outputs, that's why there is an S. Output uh, value, again. Now, uh, in order to... Let's say, to make it simple, if you want to write that, we added this JSON command, a JSON flag to GRASS in order to quickly write up some um, processing chains later on.
and it's also internally used. Because you can now imagine that if you have processing chains and the user comes with something new, uh, using this me uh, mechanism, you can turn everything into JSON easily. And this could be whatever script. And if you now want uh, to have, for example, Snap, is a Snap. Uh, this is a software, yeah, Java-based and so on, in order to do Sentinel and other processing. Um, then you say, okay, Java, now what? But uh, Snap comes with a Python interface called Snappy or SnapPy, maybe, um, which lets us bridge through Python to the functionality in Snap. Still, we are lacking the interface. And uh, in Grass, we have the possibility to easily write add-ons. And um, so if we want to write an add-on and we are truly lazy, then we can just use something which is quite similar to it. Yeah, imagine you want to write your own buffer routine, um, but it should do something else. With minus script, we get already a template ready, even with copyright statement, the description, and then you just need to modify this. And um, what is that here? This is the description of the interface, so the different parameters, the flags, and uh, let's see, here you see input. Yeah, you remember input we had, input map, is of type string, it is of course required, and so on, name of input vector map. And like this, you would write a section also for Snappy. But later on in the command, here is also the Python template, put code here. Yeah, this could then be Snappy. Yeah, this doesn't need to be grass. This could also be your super cool Python function or could be GDAL or whatever you can imagine. Whatever goes into Python can be here. Why not R or LibreOffice on command line? Yeah, doesn't matter. The only trick is you recycle this kind of uh, parameter management here, which we also use to write add-ons or the standard grass commands. And like this, whatever you put here, snappy, gdal, what it is, behaves like a grass command, and like this it behaves compliant to Actinia. So we basically write wrapper functions ar around it, and then we would get the same output here, of course similar, let's say, but it contain, comes with your own stuff. So you, if you have a classification routine or watershed modeling, put it there, put these few lines which you can partially auto-generate around, and you are done. <clears throat> okay, I think that writing Python uh, JSON is fairly simple. But still, maybe you forgot a comma here and the thing doesn't work anymore. Um, you can do some validation and there are online tools for that. There are also offline tools for that. Of course, Actinia will also tell you, no, this doesn't work here. You can do an online validation also in Actinia, at least if the syntax is right. Um, that's also possible. Okay, any questions so far? This is what I would tell about REST. Now our REST experts over there, would you tell something else? I don't feel offended. Okay. So, uh, I have no clue about web stuff. Uh, mm -hmm. Okay, for tomorrow I will change that statement. <laughs> um, yeah, so we could now start. Um, we have some demo user there. You can see the credentials here, which you will now uh, need because, of course, unauthorized access to the resources is not what we want. And now you need to decide if you go the curl way or if you go the restman way or whatever other tool you prefer. And then you could try this call. This call you can even try in the web browser. It will pop up uh, an authorization window. But it's probably better to use something which is um, ready for, 
for rest. So I think I have somewhere my Chrome thing here. So if I copy, um, I show both ways now. So I connect. Here was demo user, and here was the magic password from the web page. Sign in. And now you see status OK. Some milliseconds, type JSON. And we can scroll down. So headers, here's not so much. Body is also nothing. But we got a response back from the server. It is listing, um, it is listing the different locations which are available on the, on the server. So if who wasn't here uh, yesterday or doesn't know anything about Grass, imagine locations like project directories with different data, and the speciality, uh, specialities are two. One, it is, it's of course in Grass format here, what is inside, and secondly, one of the locations comes with a single projection, so it doesn't have multiple projections. That's all. And status is also reported. It is success. On the header side, we can see uh, some detail, technical details. When was this thing done? Uh, I think this is server time. Yeah, GMT. So it's not local here. Uh, the server also advertises what kind of server it is connection type and content type. So like this, we could also do other checks. I think health, health should be there. OK, health is not there. I didn't remember it correctly. And you see what happens. It tells you, oops, it is not there, 404. So if you put garbage here, then it will tell you nothing like that. Ah, I should probably also do the same on command line. Hmm. Source. Okay, what is this source magic I'm doing here? It is nothing else than uh, importing what is in this file into the current session. Yeah, this is Unix related. I could also open the file and copy paste the stuff here, but I'm not willing to do so. And so I just use, oh, sorry, I use this source here, which is actually. Ah, which is actually exactly doing the same thing. Everything below is commented, which means it is not executed. It is just something for myself to be faster here. So we have now, ah, maybe I can show you first echo. So print this Actinia user, just to be sure that what we were defining here, so we were defining the variable in this session, user be demo user, password be this password, and Actinia server be this server. Could be another one. Yeah, let's see if it is set. Yes, it is. And the others will also be set. So why do I use variables here? Uh, because I don't want to uh, put in every command the full string of, of, the, mm, of the user and the password. So I tell curl. Curl is some command line tool to get data and to do REST requests and so on. Use the user this and this and send a get statement to the server, which was this variable here, name of the server, API version 1, and show me the locations. So this locations is an endpoint now. This is the endpoint, show me the location, which is basically a task you can do. So I think ongoing, I, I have um, more or less only the curl version here. 
Yeah, here I use a different style, a little bit. I was just putting, to make it not endless on command line, I put it into the variable authentication out together, minus u, demo, user, and password. Yeah. I will replicate it here. So I do the two definitions, Actinia user and then only auth. And now I can modify this here and simplify it to authentication. And the U is also there already here. No need to write it anymore. Curl out and voila, it doesn't work. Cool. Uh, what did I forget? Ah, curly braces. Hmm. Yeah. Okay, so you need to define, specify it this way. Ah, I know why. Okay. Yeah, please. Please forget about the first one. So let's do it clean again. Server defined. Authentication defined. And now the curly braces. This is the third one. It's right in the online resource. Curly because there's an uh, exclamation mark there. And the exclamation mark is expanded on command line. To, uh, ex it, it's a trick in Unix or in Unix shell to uh, get the last command again. So if I do this, it's the last command starting with the C. And so it finds an uh, exclamation mark there, and it will do the last command starting with the P. But we do not want that, and the curly braces around, they prevent from that. But anyway, here it is correct. Okay, uh, the list of the map sets could be the next topic here. What is inside the location? So I take... Look at the locations. I see there's a North Carolina state plane metric uh, location available. I can attach it to this list here. You see the command above was this one. And now we simply make it longer by telling, okay, look into this, what you have found here. And then we use the endpoint map sets. And we get something much longer. Is anyone already offline, kind of not following this yourself? Shall I repeat it in RESTman? Or is it okay? Okay, just tell me. So now we got something much longer. And uh, the details are, this, the first thing is the acceptance time. When was the job accepted? Imagine you have a busy server, the stuff is queuing and so on, and at some point it is accepted. Then you have API information here. Date time, the code, everything is fine. And the processing was finished. And now the processing chain list, it was internally using GMAP sets in order to create the list of uh, map sets we have. That is a grass command. And the return code was zero, which means success. And it returns the available map sets in this standard out here. The slash n is new line, but it comes like a long one, and the parser would then pass it and separate one, two, three, four, five. Like in this representation here. You say it more human readable here. Permanent Landsat modis, and there are two other spooky map sets somebody has generated on the server. And the resource has an ID. And uh, this ID, we can even see details, like uh, taking this status code here, we can bring it to the browser or something else and open it. So, surprisingly, we see the same, because that is exactly the resource. So now you can maybe understand that whatever is generated on the server is called resource, and it gets some uh, random number code there to be distinct, 
so that we can distinguish, or the server can distinguish it. And since this one is uh, done in the ephemeral mode, it will disappear. After, I don't know exactly when it disappears, in some hours from now, maybe tomorrow, I don't remember, I should look it up. Um, but this was a query we have done. We got back the status. We now know the list of um, map sets we have available, and then it just can go away. Remember, we had the delete uh, statement. We could send to it. We could actively delete this, but, I mean, it's, we don't care. The server can clean up itself. Okay, if you are fine with that, I would go on with this stuff here. Or do you want to simply try yourself? Maybe yes. Um, let's say the list map mayor you can quickly go through. Yeah, not much is happening. You get basically a list of things. I only do a few of them. You can list raster maps and vector maps. Uh, and we also have the space-time thing, uh, which is then introduced by Veronica tomorrow. So this is much, where is it here? This is much longer. The process results are looking like that. This is a space-time cube of MODIS NDVI global, 16 days granularity, granularity. Clarity, of course. Uh, then we have the different resolution. We have start time and end time. Uh, what else do we have? The values of... Uh, it is coded in integer, I believe. That's why it is um, needs to be divided by 100 to get percent. Like NDVI representation. Uh, when it was last modified, the bounding box, uh, and so on. Here's the start time. Temporal type is absolute. It's not relative time, but it is like incidental uh, coverages of NDVI. Yeah, and so we have such a data set also available here. We can also look at the individual list of that. And so we get a lot of answers here. Maybe I open it actually in, uh, in the browser because then it's colored. So it is internally a listing. You'll see that tomorrow, no, this afternoon. Um, T Rust list, temporal raster uh, list all, all maps. Ah, yeah, this is a different data set. These are precipitation data. Um, yeah, and here you see the different entries. So this is layer zero, layer one, and so on. And they come with the timestamp. So this is the precipitation annual precipitation from the 1st January of 1955, 1956, and so on. So it's a long, 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 long list. Remember, this is for machine consumption. Yeah? You can read it, but it's usually interpreted by machines. Okay, the next topic is how to query something. I will copy the command here, which is a bit longish. And I will explain it to you. So, first part is easy. Uh, the authentication. You send always authentication because otherwise it will not talk to you. Um, then we have a post. It's not a get, but a post this time. Because we want to send some information to it and tell the server... Uh, magic? Um, sorry? Time is up. Can we convince it to go back? Ah, here, okay. Hello. Ah, no, no, no. You mean something else, I guess, to turn the green ones? But it's not in this control magic. Let's try this. No. Ah, here are more buttons. Mm. 
shut down zip pool too. Okay, can you read it anyway? I don't know. Sorry, I have no clue. So we tell it, okay, look server, we will send you some JSON here. And then we have the endpoint to be defined. And the endpoint is Actinia server location. And this is the state pane uh, North Carolina one. In the map set mode is land surface temperature. There is a space time raster data set, which is called LST day monthly. Remember from before, you can get the list, so that's easy. And now the job is please do some sampling on it. And we send this information here. This is the payload, we can say. The JSON code to say, okay, I give you now um, an EPSG code 43 to 6. I will give you two coordinates. This is roughly Bonn. Does it make sense? Ooh. I'm surprised myself. Let's see what happens. Say again? This process is something similar to the JSON. Yes, to. Yes, I will come to this in a moment. Yeah, so I was clever enough to make a query um, on MODIS in North Carolina, which is actually uh, re retrieved with bone coordinates. So, not surprisingly, no result. This was not intentional. Can anyone tell me lat long of North Carolina, please? It's 30 something north. 36 north? Yes. And like, uh, what is that? 70 something, right? 78. 79. 79. Minus, huh? Yeah, minus. Yes. Success. Okay, you see, here are values, the common modis, uh, sorry, LST values. This is again, probably, uh, if I recall correctly, this is December. So it's to be divided by 1,000. We coded the data in, uh, in integer. That's a common strategy to save disk space. That's if, Kelvin by ah, that's Kelvin. Ah, we have to do apply the, OK. These are more or less raw data from yeah. your course. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, OK. So we could, and maybe later today, write a nice. Do that later. Yes, <laughs> you do it later today. And once after that course, you can go before dinner, write a process chain of two commands, <laughs> retrieval, and then um, multiply with the magic uh, to get it from Kelvin, modus Kelvin, so to say, uh, into Celsius or whatever you want. Okay, but you see how it works, more or less. Now the, the right question is, how can I know how this uh, is done? And we have an API for that, uh, sorry, API description. It, the link is somewhere in the in the tutorial. So we have the Actinia server. Well, this is one deployment we have online. And um, here's the latest API documentation. Here's also a tutorial. Here's some simple steps. And you click on this API documentation. And it, it renders the documentation automatically. So this is the link from the software itself, source code. Uh, of course. All right, this I didn't show yet. Um, so how did we got this result here? We can scroll back. It does T Rust sample. Ah, okay. So what it does, it boils down, let's say this is a predefined endpoint already there. Um, it is nothing else than some grass magic in the background, which is uh, specifically the T Rust sampling. That means it takes a, a space time 
raster data set and does the point sampling. This is standard grass command behind. So now you can imagine we could write an endless number of predefined endpoints, which we haven't done yet, but pull requests are accepted on GitHub if you have something you want to see there. The question was how to know about it. And if you go into this, um, into this API description, then you can see here uh, the different parts. And we were, I believe, in sampling. So I go here. And here you see the, uh, the endpoint sampling async, so are different ones. And they're also, ah, yeah, this I didn't explain yet. I will come to the difference between synchronous and asynchronous. Yeah, but here you have the explanation how the stuff is done. And what's really nice about uh, this kind of API documentation, it is automatically generated from the source code. So it's always corresponding to what's on the server. And we use this uh, redocly or what it is called, um, in order to make it a nice uh, representation because the documentation itself is all, also nothing else than a JSON file. Looks like this. And now you can go through. So if you want to quickly look up here, you see it maybe. You can just look through all the endpoints available. Yeah, This is, the, let's say, the short view on it. You can then expand one and see what is in there, and it goes into detail, but then it starts to be hard to read. So for the list, in a, in a nicer way, you just go to this representation. It renders it. There are different, different providers doing this kind of stuff. Yeah. Then with processing, yeah, we have uh, processing of uh, execution of process chains available. Sampling I already mentioned. We have statistical stuff like uh, aerial data and so on. Vector management, delete a vector, and so on and so on. What else is there? Satellite data, vegetation index computation, query Google Landsat archive, uh, query Sentinel archive, create NDVI from arbitrary Sentinel scene, and so on. Yeah, so there's already plenty of stuff and growing. And you can just go through and then you figure out how the things work. Yeah. Yes. So you can imagine that a job takes a long while. This one query, one point, okay, that's easy. But uh, say you want to process 50 years of climatic data and do something complicated with it. This could run maybe for an hour, let's say, or maybe uh, if it's better, if it's um, yeah, whatever, some time. If you say synchronous, like this, you see it is waiting. You wait, bong, you have the result. If it would take one hour, you would sit exactly one hour here and wait for the result. If you do the submission as asynchronous, then you submit it to the server. The server does the job, but it returns here to the command line. And the last one, the status uh, resource, you can then go and pull and query, hey, are you ready? Hey, are you ready? Yeah, this is then the asynchronous mode where you uh, retrieve back, ready, 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 yes. And then you have the result. But you get the command line. You get the command line back. So again, we talk about machine-to-machine -machine communication. So in your client, which is maybe not curl, but your fancy application, which has outsourced the job of Sentinel processing to this Actinia in this case, it just does internally the polling, yeah? And when it is done, you get the result. Polling means you query, are you ready? Are you ready? That is called polling. Uh, later on, um, there is this uh, tool in the grass session. It does the polling automatically, so you do not have to always do it yourself. But with curl, you would just go here, retrieve the status, retrieve the status. Yeah, but again, it's not made for that. So probably if you are in inter interactive mode like here, you prefer to use the synchronous mode because then you just go for coffee and later on you see the result. On machine base, you will probably go for the asyn asyn asynchronous mode. Uh, 
Uh, yeah, maybe I should take, uh, I think it's not in the tutorial yet, I will try to remember that I put it there. Now, it will get a bit difficult if we have uh, this um, code here that we want to query something and it gets super long because it's a full process chain. We can do something else. We can store this in a file. So I take the code up to here, open text editor, my query actinia.pc, for example, process chain, or I use JSON. I copy it inside. This editor is aware of JSON, so it shows it in color. And then I can, instead of doing, wait, I want to fix the coordinates. Minus 78, 36, I think we had. Now I go and use, uh, send this as a file to a curl with via curl. So the payload with minus D is now a file. And note this add sign here, it indicates file name is coming. Could also be path to file. Okay, something is wrong. Yes, of course, because I had a different name. I called it my query today. And we have the result again. So for more complex uh, process chains, you definitely want to write them down in a file because then you can also more easily do validation and so on. And you send it via file. In RESTman, uh, there is, I believe, the same possibility. You have a POST request. And then somewhere where I don't remember, you can add the, maybe it's here, no. Does anyone know? I didn't look it up, sorry. That's theme. Okay, it will be there somewhere. Yeah. Enjoy the manual, I don't draw. Uh, we can also do a validation of a process chain. There we use a different endpoint, which is not surprisingly called process chain validation, and then sync or async. So I copy this. We have already executed it, so uh, apparently it's working. But we can just send it once more. And so amusingly, and this I didn't understand, we get an error, so maybe there's something buggy in the Actinia itself. I will have to check to do actinia.text. Okay, so I have taken a note. So here was the block of uh, explaining async versus sync, but we have already done it, so I can also write a few more lines here uh, later on. We still have some time, is it correct? 45, one minute? Okay. <laughs> Yeah, good. Uh, I would like to... No, okay. Are you so far so nice or do you have questions? Okay, so next I would like to show you um, how to control everything from grass. Just overview what, what I have more or less prepared. I must admit this is the first time ever I do this course. Uh, because it is totally new, everything. Um, we have here a block about controlling Actinia from a running grass session. This I would like to show, and we need these uh, dependencies here already mentioned. Then we have something more or less like self-study, but this is maybe too much, I'm not so sure, to write your own uh, things, just some ideas what you could do. Uh, but you can also do these ideas uh, in using the previous section, which we now start, uh, by uh, writing the stuff up in grass and then sending it out, if, just to get a feeling for this JSON process chain stuff. There's a link to more uh, scripts. So we have also a collection of curl commands on the Actinia repository. 
which does a bit more. There, um, I just uh, show you quickly what is there, not using it. So again, authentication. Uh, you know that. That is, again, the listing stuff, delete stuff, and so on. Mm. Yeah, ah, render an image. We haven't done this yet. Maybe this one is nice to see. Okay, now you see nothing. Why is that? Because we have used the authentication. We have sent a bounding box as payload with minus D. We have sent a get command. And then we say in North Carolina map set permanent uh, raster layer, the elevation map, please render it. So the endpoint is rendering. This you would find in the API description in the long list. And write out the, f uh, the result to a file. I don't know if curl has anything different. I didn't read the manual. Then redirection of it for the Windows users. And now you see it saves this file here. Importantly, rendering means it's just a view on it, kind of quick look. Yeah, it's not the original file. To retrieve original file is a geotiff. In this case, uh, would be an export function. We also have that, of course. But we will have show that later. Um, okay, this we have already seen. This we have seen. Here's another processing chain to play with. Uh, it is a slope aspect computation. Uh, and here's another one doing even more. It's fairly long. Validation and running it. And then in, the, in this example, we have parallel computation. So I don't do this now or not even today. If you're interested, take a look. How to run processes in parallel to fire uh, many of them. And with export function as well, do a kind of massive parallel computation, so with 16 different jobs, uh, temporal, spatial temporal sampling we have done. Here's a different example for that. Here's some example. I don't know if we have the data still on the server. I will check that uh, on Sentinel processing. Yeah, it is an AWS query. I think this is no longer possible uh, because, uh, to my knowledge, Amazon started to charge for that. And so you would need a, a user on Amazon for that, which is uh, equipped with a credit card access. Okay, but you can imagine. We have something prepared for OpenEO use case. This is definitely work in progress. Uh, yeah, so and so on and so on. So we have uh, some examples as well available here. Okay, and then I went, uh, invented some half-done exercises, but I was unfortunately not able in the last weeks to write it up completely. Just ideas for you if you want to play around uh, with the tools to, to uh, do population uh, risk exposure near coastal areas. We have a global population map on the server as well, like the SRTM. Global shorelines you could get from natural earth data, and then proposed workflow. So this you could also write up in grass and then send it out. And the second one is even more complex, property risk assessment from trees around buildings. So you can fetch building footprints from OpenStreetMap, for example. Um, you can use the importer to get it on the server. Uh, get some sentinel scene, do buffering, do a tree estimation using vegetation index or whatever idea you have. Idea you have, maybe use some machine learning tool. We can also use uh, extensions in in Actinia because that's an extension extension actually, and then do some statistics around it. So just to play with. But I want to go back now to this uh, running it from Actinia from Grass. Mm -hmm. and we convert everything to the proper JSON format. Yeah. It's like command by command, or can I do it like in 
No, in a block. Yes. Yes. Um, yeah, you basically a bit anticipate what I will show. <laughs> but I show you one example only. The thing is uh, that um, you are currently on demo user, and I don't have uh, created a Geostat user. So maybe I do that and send it to you then. So the thing is simply, if I put out uh, the Geostat user with superpowers online, then we will not be owner of our own server anymore because people start to do a lot of stuff. The demo user is a bit limited in the amount of pixels you can use. Uh, we have control on which commands you can actually use or which endpoints and so on. It's a bit restricted. It's to play around so we don't have to buy or rent uh, huge servers. Uh, an example is... Uh, which one? Like generalization of, of vector lines. For this, you cannot use the demo user because you do not have access to the generalizer. That is uh, restricted. So you basically start grass. You have the tool I will show in a moment, which is imagine something like curl, but a bit more convenient. And then you do this single line here, which retrieves data from a server where you have the, the, the administrative boundaries available. Unfortunately, the natural earth data server is not compliant. I don't know what happened. It used to work, but since some days it doesn't anymore. You import it on the fly into this map name. You can choose yourself. And this you give to the generalizer. You say, the new map name shall be this one, DP for Douglas Polker, and I please want this in, in GML uh, format back. So this is the magic here with the plus. Input, yeah, you know from grass, input is map name, but the map name is not there. So we say plus and then give the resource as a web URL. That's the cool feature. And we say, result, please deliver in GML in this case. GeoPackage uh, supposed to work. It's apparently not yet online. Uh, we will have that also soon. And then you say, OK, use the Douglas reduction method and use these thresholds, which is part of the generalizer. And then what happens? This is only a single line, but you can have more. What happens? It does the generalization. It downloads on the fly the input map. It does the generalization and deliver, delivers you back a download link, and you have the GML in this case back. So yeah. Remembering that Grass is a topological GIS, you can now imagine there's an add on called uh, VCLEAN v OGR. You import your, you put here your broken shapefile, and you get back a polished one. Okay, uh, one more, a bit more, uh, a bit longer. Let's see if it was this one. Yeah, the only part is the yellow part here. The rest is only tutorial style. Yeah, I hope it's readable. Is it readable? Not really. I take it out into a separate one. What's that? Well, it goes from echo to this file. This is the real job, because the rest is only tutorial stuff. Or oh, what did I miss? Ah, the L. Ah, sorry, sorry. Here is the L. Now, um, we get the map into, uh, into Actinia. Using vinfo is even sufficient. And we have here the addition of the resource. And then we say, OK, a line. Uh, the vector data, or let's say the computational region, what we want to compute, to the population map. This is the global, uh, what is it called, uh, human settlement layer offered by JRC, which is already on the server. This is one case of persistent storage. Yeah, we do not want to see every user fetching gigabyte of stuff just to co compute something, so we offer already something ready to play, the analysis ready data it would be. And then uh, on the global map, 
uh, align the, the vector position, the bounding box of the, of the uh, vector admins to the pixel uh, geometry of the population map. Yeah, that's all. So um, then we do the zonal statistics. Here we use the vector tool for that, vector raster statistics. We say the vector map is this, the raster map is that. The vector map just came from the resource here. And please add the following column, the summary, min, max, average, standard deviation, percentile, and the percentile, please, 95th percentile. And then we want to export it. And this is the, now we are talking about grass augmented with the Actinia uh, command execution. There's one extension you have to install. Um, it's the exporter function. The name is not definite. Maybe we call it ace.exporter would be maybe better. And then we say export the new vector map. It's the same vector map, but it uh, received more columns here. Yeah, with all the statistics inside. And please send it out as a GML. So it doesn't really matter in which order I show you stuff, since you don't have, unfortunately, because of the user rights, the possibility to do that. Uh, how do I call it? Zip code pop starts dot shell. It's a shell script, actually. So I've saved this now as a shell script. Um, <clears throat> I go to my... Okay, so we start with simply with demo. Where's my grass session? It's not here. Ah, yes. Mm. Yeah, this I need. Now, I go into grass. I have a more or less empty map set I call it ACE. You can call it as you wish. And now I want to turn this script into something else. I have this ACE installed. This, I think, I didn't really explain. It comes with some longish help text. And now, instead of this, I use dry run. And I have to specify the... Where did I put it? I'm sorry. Where did this? Ah, it is here. Okay. You have to give the absolute path, importantly. I think this is enough. It is not. Okay, let me see. Ah, yes, I have to say in which... Ah, minus script was missing. Okay. Okay, now what we are doing. We have this tool. We say dry run, so it doesn't do anything. Uh, please use on the target server this location. I think it is exactly not this one, but it is lot. No. Okay, I need to cheat because I don't remember. Which one was it now? This one? Ah, in the Molvide we have to run it. Yes. I hope this works. What I have to do first uh, before running, I have of course to activate my credentials and then I will use the superpower ones and not the demo user, but I will show that in a moment. So dry run was the topic. Yeah, we gave it the, we give it the script and automatically it comes with uh, the JSON. So that's all you have to do if you want to write a process chain in JSON if you are in the grass terminal and use this tool. So honestly, I find it quite convenient. Um, and then you can, of course, come up. Maybe in the long run, we will have kind of toolboxes, uh, sorry, kind of template collection for online somewhere to play with of uh, existing processing chains so that you can, from a catalog, download that. But uh, yeah, coming soon. It didn't happen yet. Uh, 
I think so. I didn't try. We try in the break. So you see the commands back module with the URL. So import description, the source of it, the region we did, raster statistics we did, and export the thing. So now I submit it, and first I do the credentials. So these are different credentials. Okay, it was accepted, and now you see this polling here. And we got something back. So we can now take this resource and download it. I, oh, sorry, I have to be authenticated, of course, also to get this one. In the browser, I still have my authentic other authentication running. That's why I can do that. So you see, uh, not a, uh, even if you know the URL, if you don't have the credentials, you cannot retrieve the result. So there's all the, always this um, mechanism of um, uh, control. Unzip the file. The GML is pretty big. <coughs> That's why it is coming in is a co in compressed form. And since it is a map, we can now open it here. Yeah, this is a lot long, but it could be in something else. And I guess if I retrieve one of those areas here, you see all the new uh, columns here, which we just added. So what we did, we told it, look over there is the vector map. Uh, we already have on the server the ready to use raster map do the statistics and give me the, uh, the improved uh, vector map back. On the main side, just before doing again one of those things, um, because I missed that before, I would like to show you, I'm not sure if this user is uh, enabled to do that. You can imagine, I just don't do this right now, but you can use an endpoint which is called Sentinel NDVI. And then you give it the, the scene. And NDVI only needs two channels because the red and the infrared channel. And in the background, it fetches the data not from ESA, but from Google, because Google, as I mentioned earlier this morning, or yeah, uh, offers the data uh, in an unpacked way. So we can just take this and this channel instead of fetching the insta entire package. Yes, and then you would get back this one. So it's um, GML that you just showed. You have this JSON link where the data is, you give that to the server, the peer that yes. you know that you're looking for Sentinel and it knows where to Exactly. So for some data resources, um, we have some endpoints implemented where also the source of the data is implemented. Yeah, in this case, it was user-based. Yeah, it is just a generic, we wrote ourselves script. But if you use, a, uh, you find it in the, in the API, what I showed before here, under Sentinel, somewhere image, where is it? Uh, satellite image algorithms, it is somewhere here in the list. Yeah, here you see explicitly it takes it from Google. Somewhere should be Sentinel, NDVI of an arbitrary. This is not limited anymore to Sentinel 2A. This I have to update. But um, yeah, it will take the band 4 and 8. And they are also taken from Google internally. This is already coded. So this is like a ready to use endpoint. And uh, the custom ones are user defined, so you can do both. Exactly. So this would be now what we have to do. Um, yeah. So the scripts are sitting here. You go to the uh, 
to this page here. So I, I want to have it available through G extension that we just uh, do G extension and then it comes, but yeah, I did manage. Took a nap this night, so I didn't finish this part. <laughs> uh, we have to download it manually. You go here and take this script. Uh, I think you can have it like, if you click on raw, then you can do right mouse button, save page. I know it's not very cool, sorry for this, but uh, it's doable, I hope. So what did I do? Let's start from the beginning. We go to the Actinia core repository, which is this one. Okay, once you are there, you scroll down and you go into scripts. Then you already arrived. And there are two or three uh, different tools. I didn't find out how to download this with G extension from GitHub. I think it's not possible. Uh, so we have to do it manually. In the end, you need three files. File one is this one. So I copy it. I don't know. Do we have, uh, should I put it in MetaMost or something? Would it help? The file two is <coughs> going, ah, going back is the exporter and file three is the importer. But here we need the entire directory. Uh, mm -hmm, how to do that? Maybe maybe this would work. Yeah, I've made it add-on style. Maybe that works. G extension. URL equal this. Also the name. Extension equal the name. Let's see. Almost. Yeah, the nasty thing, it wants something called master. It is not there. Exactly. So we simply have to move it out into a different one. What I can do, I can just do it now. Yeah, I do it now in an ugly way. Who cares? And I do it more beautiful later. Okay, but anyway, we need the exporter, the importer, and the master. Yeah, three things. How to create a new repo now, quickly? Mm -hmm. No, no, you can, the examples I've prepared are all read, more or less ready to use with a, do, a demo user. <coughs> ah, I have to go here. Okay, I will quickly generate. Exporter. and copy it inside, okay? Just hold on. Is it not this, not this? Mm.
I'll just do it quick and dirty, git push. Okay, now see if that works. Yes. Cool, so next thing is exporter. Uh, you probably didn't see what I did, so I put it into the text file. Yeah, this is Python 3. Yeah, it is in Ubuntu, it's under experimental. Yes. And if you look on the Grass website under Downloads Linux, there's a Ubuntu. Or unstable, I don't know what it is called. Really? Arg. It's also 7.6 because that uh, will you. Okay, but let's see if the link is wrong. Um, uh, Angelos packaged it, okay. For unknown reasons, it exists twice here. Yeah, sorry, I thought it was there. Maybe it was taken off again. Mm, yeah. Okay, wait, but I, you can't probably try to use it nonetheless because in the end it's just fake scripts and it is uh, yeah try it in 7.6 before we complain let's try uh, because it's not really it's uh, in the end independent Okay, so license GPL create. Okay, exporter is also there in a moment.
Okay, exporter is ready. And installation is simply exporter, exporter. Great. Did you manage to get it? Ah, uh, there are, yes. Mm. You are in grass, right? Dollar. Gis, what is it called? Gis, base. Bin. So the easiest way is it needs to be installed somewhere in the path. And then change mod R plus X. So this would be probably the best commands to install it, like this. If you do not have rights, uh, the rights to write there, then you sudo. So unfortunately for Windows users, I have no idea how to solve this right now. But if any advanced Windows users is willing to tell me what I put into the instructions, then I'm happy to do so. TXT. Oh, is it called TXT? Yeah. yeah uh, then please take off the TXT extension. Yeah. Can I help anyone? Are you ready? You try. It is existing if you are in the grass session. The script must be somewhere in the path. So probably the most clever way is to first do this because you have to be in grass for that, right? And then do. You need to be in the grass GIS session.
Okay, I've just updated the, the documentation. So if you F5 the course in 120 seconds from now, it will be there. Because the, the tutorial here is uh, auto-generated. So here's under the needed Python libraries, there will be now a new block, hopefully soon, with what we just did. Okay, maybe we just continue. Um, so, I have put this, this, the, this part uh, is separate on, in, on this link here, it's basically the readme next to the script. We now assume that everything is running the settings we have to set in the grass session again. So I go back to my session. Here I am. You can use whatever location. It doesn't matter because you tell uh, uh, always what, what you use. Okay, available data you may read yourself what is there. Um, now we try first thing. We want to list locations. And this tool is taking the variables here for authentication. And then it sends to the server list the locations. You remember the curl command we have done before. Yeah, it was something like this. Uh, will be somewhere the list location thing. It does exactly the same. Uh, we are not authenticated in this one. Okay, but you remember it from before. So it's a kind of wrapper similar to, um, to the curl, but maybe a bit more convenient. So like this, you can do all kinds of listings. But now we also, I, I go, because we are close to end of the session. I jump a bit further, list some raster maps in one location. And so you can maybe remember that we saw that. And this is only a, a shallow representation of the JSON which comes back. Yeah, so this ACE tool is doing like fetching individual elements of the JSON just for readability. So this was nothing computed yet. Um, we have also job management. Here you can easily see if jobs were finished or done or are still running. And you get the resources uh, like a list. Yeah, show running jobs. Get information about a specific job that we have also seen before. You can inspect the call before you do. This was the dry run magic. Okay, this you can imagine. Now with the dry run, we do some random command. It is not executed. It is just translated into J the JSON. And this is essentially what happens if you, um, if you write a chain of commands in a shell script, in Python probably as well. Maybe for the Python scripts, yeah, I don't know. I have to check that. So the rendering is a bit different. No, sorry, it's not different. It requires more power uh, than the demo user has. So I just do that now. I switch on the fly to my other credentials. Okay, now I have my other credentials, and I believe I can now do that. So I uh, ask, uh, tell me some metadata about this globe cover ESA map, and this is the amount of pixels we have here. So quite a few. And if I want to look at it, you remember the curl render command. Yeah, it is similar, render raster. Oh, wow, there it is already. So we have now rendered a, a thumbnail out of how many is that? Uh, seven billion pixels. So why is it fast? Because grass, of course, doesn't read seven billion pixels. 
but it does kind of uh, low-level resampling because we just requested a thumbnail, so you get a thumbnail and it's fast. Okay, here are some more examples. We can check what is on the server, but I think we have to give it really the location. Ah, this, okay, you have seen, I did not specify the location here. In this case, you don't say location on the server be this one. It transmits the location name in which we are. If that's useful or not, I don't know. I would personally recommend to always specify because then you know what you get. So the list for those familiar with the North Carolina data set looks, of course, the same, but it is the list from the server and not the local one. Okay, some more examples, the, re the re region, the same thing. And now, eventually, uh, the example before we close, we write a new script. Vim this script here. And we do these commands here. I will explain. So what do you see? We start with set the uh, computational region to the elevation map, but the elevation map, please fetch from this online resource here. And then run the computational, uh, the univariate statistics, give me some information, generate the slope aspect, and please give me the elevation, uh, the slope map as a geotiff. Okay, so this we save. This is more or less a standard script. And this we can then execute. I will also put here minus minus location is ncspm08. And I send it to the server. I don't. Ah, sorry. Maybe we have to put the real path home. So this is where I am. Resources accepted. And we are almost ready. This is not an error. It's just the missing color table. And here is the map. So I open it in QGIS. And here you go. So this was now the uh, slope elevation map with a not so nice color table because uh, GeoTIFF cannot do that. Let's try another one. OK, you can imagine. So like this, we wrote a simple script. We actually sent it to the server. The data were already there, partially. OK, in fact, it's not true because the data were actually not there. OK, time to have lunch break, I guess. We fetch the data from this online resource, it was. We do the computation. We, we order to get it back in GeoTIFF. The same thing you can do with Vector, of course. Then you get a GML or in future a Geo package. And that's it. It needs to be available. That's the trick. I am not sure if you can also give uh, credentials there, but probably yes, in case this source is not public but uh, hidden. Maybe it's, I don't remember. Maybe you will just say user, user colon password at URL. I need to look it up. Um, so you can basically fetch arbitrary sources here which makes it maybe also a bit dangerous for us, so we have to work on that. At least we know that you were it because you have to authenticate. Um, and then we get it back as a, as a map. And like this, you can now write whatever process chain you can imagine. And it's over with this trip and then it stays on the server for one day? Or is this yes, exactly. So I will look up what the current time is we have put there and we'll also add it to the tutorial. No, no, exactly not. So let's take this uh, one and we use maybe a different browser. I'm not sure if I'm authenticated here. Yes, I am. So I go back, I go to private mode. So I think I'm now unknown to, yes. So it will ask you for authentication. So it's protected. 
if you want to give, let's say, the resources there, you have computed, you call your colleague, look, it's ready. I mean, you will send an email probably with the URL. This colleague also has to have the credentials, otherwise uh, they cannot access. Yeah, I would say time is up for this tutorial. Um, yeah, some ideas if you want to play around. And conclusion is uh, we are working on it. There's more up coming up. If you want to join us uh, in development, the URL is available. And I will also add the paper reference uh, of our paper. And with that, I would like to thank you for your attention. And I hope you got some ideas how, how this stuff works. Thank you. <laughs>